Large Children's Hospital in the Pediatric Mental Health Institute. And a couple of years ago, I was a part of the DSM-5 field trial, which is essentially the research study that says whether or not particular questions or even diagnoses would show up in this giant manual, this thousand page manual that people use to diagnose people with mental health conditions. We were one of five sites. And I was picked for this study because I have an affinity for spreadsheets. <laughs> and I really, really like protocol. I like to stick to things, I see a process, and I see it laid out in all the ways that it can happen. And so naturally, I was the one who made the schedules, um, but I also interviewed children. I spent many days asking children, have you been sad on five days in the last week? And has that sadness interfered with your ability to be at home or at school? See, I participated in conference calls with the American Psychological Association. I'm not bragging, it's just what happened. <laughs> um, and we would talk about symptoms, symptomatology, whether or not this belonged in this diagnosis or that. And so I thought I knew mental illness. I was therefore a professional person working in mental illness. But the truth is, I didn't know mental illness until 2010. In September, my son was born. Something I spent time planning for and was hypothetically excited for. Except for when he came out, y'all know how that happens. Uh, all I could feel instead of this amazing sense of excitement and oh my gosh, a human, uh, which I thought they sprinkled something on backstage. Um, I, all I could feel was amazing overwhelm. Now I had a human to take care of. And where are all my protocols? And where are the schedule? I don't know how to do this. And unfortunately or fortunately for me, it seemed like the human didn't like me that much either. <laughs> he cried all the time. And that's possibly because he might have had a dairy allergy that was never diagnosed, or I was a bad mother, I have no real idea. But I spent the whole first year of his life wishing that I hadn't had a baby. And I spent time thinking about how I could just drop this little person off at somebody else's door, and I bet they would do a better job than me. Because for me, he wouldn't sleep. For me, we would be up together at all hours of the day. And because I'm a good researcher, I read every single book there is to read about sleep. I can tell you about the Ferber method, the no cry sleep solution, the nanny method, the shush pat. I could write a book report on each one of these methods. But none of that helped me deal with this little human who could not sleep. And so I stopped sleeping. I stopped sleeping and, unfortunately, I was also having trouble swallowing. But at work, I was this competent human. I'd go to day in, day out and ask people, are you having trouble eating? How long have you had that problem? And for me, I was having a hard time swallowing yogurt. I lost more than 20 pounds more below my pregnancy weight but people were congratulating me on how good I looked. And what's interesting about the whole thing about having a baby is you're at work and people are so excited. They want to talk about the little baby and their faces and the photos and all the things that come with babies. Did he poop today? Yeah. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> but nobody asked me how I was doing. Because after he came out of my body, he was the only thing that mattered. And so many of the people in my circle, they wanted to know how he was too. And so I just kept talking about him and forgot about me. It was his one year birthday the night before. As we were playing this large party where all my friends would come, 
<laughs> All I could think about was, I really hope he sleeps tonight. But he didn't. <laughs> and I held his little body crying and screaming, and all I could do was punch the couch beside me. And when I was doing that, I was so thankful for those don't shake a baby commercials. Because <laughs> as a woman with a master's degree, I was about to shake the baby. And while, yeah, it's a little like, should I laugh? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I uh, came to his birthday party and I realized, you know what, this is not normal. I need some help. And so I called the helpline and they told me it was going to be 13 weeks. Yep, 13 weeks. That's how I was supposed to wait. But things got worse. Nine weeks in, I decided that I couldn't take it anymore. And it's not that I necessarily wanted to end my life. I just wanted to stop the pain and to sleep. And so I called the emergency room and told them about how I was thinking about hurting myself. How I was thinking about locking my car and turning on the engine in my garage. And I went to the emergency room and I got help. And I had an ample opportunity. I worked with 30 psychiatrists, the largest concentration of psychiatrists <laughs> in the state. And yet it was so hard for me to talk about my own life with those people. And so now, when I talk to a woman about having a human, I don't ask to see the pictures or whether they pooped. I instead look at them in the eye and ask them, how are you doing? Really? Thank you.